Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and today I'm going to deal with the anatomical basis of thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, the thoracic outlet is the space that is bounded by the manubrium of the sternum, the first costal cartilage, first rib, and the first thoracic vertebra. This space slopes downwards and forwards. And because of the obliquity of this opening, the apices of the lung and the dome of the pleura, parietal pleura that covers it, the uh, lung apices, they project into the neck. And so they might be injured, for example, in stab wood in the neck. But their projection into the neck does not exceed higher than the head of the first strip. Now, it's important to remember that the thoracic outlet is a clinical term and uh, is used to define what is anatomically referred to as the thoracic inlet. So what is a clinical thoracic outlet is an anatomical thoracic inlet, and in order to avoid confusion, it is preferable thus to use the term superior thoracic aperture to refer to this opening. In clinical textbooks, it's called the thoracic outlet because there are important vessels that leave the thorax here, like the uh, branches of the arch of the aorta, the brachiocephalic trunk on the right side, the left common carotid, and the left subclavian arteries. It is also an outlet for some of the nerves, like, for example, the sympathetic trunk, the vagus nerve, the uh, phrenic nerve, and also remember here the nerve that is affected in the syndrome, which is T1. T1, which forms part of the brachial plexus, it crosses in front of the neck of the first rib, and then at the superior border of the first rib, it fuses with the T8 root of the brachial plexus to form the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. Also remember that through this small opening, the esophagus passes from the neck. It's not shown here because it is covered by the trachea, but you can see it here that the esophagus goes from the neck into the superior and then to the inferior mediastinum. And in the front of it is the trachea. So the esophagus is actually applied to the body of the first thoracic vertebra. And then in front of it is the trachea, which uh, becomes close to the jugular notch, where it can be felt in the midline. The trachea and esophagus allows air and food to go down into the thorax, and uh, hence the basis of the anatomical name. Uh, the, the opening is called the th thoracic inlet because it allows the uh, air and food to enter into the thorax. The anatomical thoracic outlet, on the other hand, is located downwards and is better referred to as the inferior thoracic aperture. And as you can see it here, it is closed by the thoracoabdominal diaphragm which separates between the abdomen and the thorax. The inferior thoracic aperture or the anatomical thoracic outlet is formed by the xiphoid process, by the costal cartilages of the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th costal cartilages and by the 12th rib and the 12th thoracic vertebra. Now, because the term thoracic outlet syndrome is deeply ingrained in the clinical literature, therefore, as I mentioned before, that in this description, I'm going to use the clinical term thoracic outlet to refer to the superior thoracic aperture. Now, remember that the first rib forms a, an important boundary of the superior thoracic aperture of the thoracic outlet. Remember that the first rib has a superior surface and inferior surface rather than a superior border and inferior border, but it has an internal and external borders, unlike the other ribs which have external surfaces and internal surfaces. But the first rib, uh, being an atypical rib, lies horizontally. So the superior surface of the first rib is related to two muscles. We can see here, one of the muscles here is the scalenous anterior muscle. These are muscles of the neck, and it's attached to a tubercle located on the on the inner border of the first rib. And then on the posterior aspect of the superior surface is the attachment of another scalene muscle. The scalenous medius muscle is attached here. There, remember that there are three scalene muscles, the scalenous anterior, scalenous medius, and scalenous posterior. The scalenous posterior is, in fact, not attached to the first rib, but is attached to the second rib.
Look at it here. This is the scalenous anterior muscle attached to the scalene tubercle on the first rib. And then behind it is the scalenous medius. This is the scalenous medius attached more posteriorly, but again to the superior surface of the first rib. And this is the scalenous posterior muscle which is attached to the second rib. Proximally, all the scalene muscles are attached to the transverse processes of cervical vertebrae. So they can flex the neck laterally, and also because they are attached to the upper two ribs, they hold the upper two ribs and act as accessory muscles of respiration. Now the interval between scalenous anterior, here is the scalenous anterior, and the scalenous medius, and the first rib, the superior surface of the first rib, forms a triangle, which is called the scalene triangle. And as you can see that it transmits structures coursing between the thorax and the upper limb and the lower neck. This triangle contains the trunks of the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. You can see here the relations of the vessels and the nerves to the superior border of the first rib. Look at the groove, subclavian groove, which is located behind the attachment of scalenous anterior, between scalenous anterior and scalenous medius for the passage of the subclavian artery. And then very close to it is the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, which is formed by the union of T1 and C8 cervical nerves. Remember that the roots of the brachial plexus are sandwiched between scalenous anterior and scalenous medius. This is the other nerve here, which extends vertically from the thorax to the neck. This is the sympathetic trunk and closely applied to the neck of the first rib. Anterior to the attachment of scalenous anterior, there is another shallow groove for the subclavian vein. So here you can see the subclavian vein is located anterior to the attachment of scalenous anterior. And in front of scalenous anterior, as you can see it here, extending vertically downwards and thus crossing the obliquity of scalenous anterior from lateral to medial, this is the phrenic nerve on its way to the thorax. It arises from C3, 4, and 5. Now, thoracic outlet syndrome results mainly from compression of the trunks of the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. There are variants of the thoracic outlet syndrome, and sometimes it's not only the nerves and the artery that are affected, but also the vein is affected, but this is rarely. So, therefore, thoracic outlet syndrome mainly affects the structures that pass through the scalene triangle and results in neurological symptoms as well as vascular symptoms because of the compression of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. It can result from tumors of the neck. For example, Pankos tumor affecting the apex of the lung, which extends into the neck. Also, it might result from hypertrophy of scalenous anterior muscle. Here again, this is the scalenous anterior, and you can see the triangle between scalenous anterior, then we have the scalenous medius, and the first rib is not shown because here it is covered by the clavicle. And you can see that compression at this location, at this triangle, will not affect the vein because the vein crosses the superior surface of the first rib anterior to scalenous anterior, muscle. So in a condition called scalenous anterior syndrome, this condition might result in compression of the neurovascular structures located between scalenous anterior and scalenous medius and thus result in thoracic outlet syndrome. The abnormalities in scalenous anterior might result from trauma of this muscle or congenital anomalies of the muscle. Trauma might result from repetitive use of this muscle in certain sports or because of attaining certain positions in certain careers. So the muscle gets hypertrophied and causes pressure on the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus. Another condition that might result in thoracic outlet syndrome is a cervical rib. This occurs in 0.5% of the subjects. It might be bilateral, as you can see it here, and as you can see that it is attached to the transverse process of T7 vertebra. So it is located at a higher level than the level of the first rib, which is attached to the first thoracic vertebra. You can see it here in this uh, x-ray. This is the cervical rib. Sometimes it's an incomplete rib. It's not necessarily that it is well-developed on 
both sides. Sometimes the bone is replaced by fibrous bands. And as you can see here that it's attached to the transverse process of T7 vertebra. Usually this transverse process appears as downwardly projecting, opposed to the transverse process of T1. Transverse process of T1, uh, to which the first rib is attached, as you can see, is upwardly projecting. So this is the first rib here, and this is the first rib on the other side. And then above it is the cervical rib, which is attached to the transverse process of a downwardly projecting transverse process. Pressure of such a rib on the lowest trunk of the brachial plexus, as you can see here, that the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, which is formed of T1 and C8, will cause either pressure because the lower trunk will, will be squeezed between the cervical rib and scaliness muscle, or it will result in kinking of the nerve as well as the artery. So you can see here on this side, the subclavian artery is compressed between the cervical rib and scalenous anterior muscle. You can see that there is a post-stenotic dilatation and the nerves which are located a little bit behind the artery, they will have to go up the lower roots, especially T1, has to go up and then will be kinked and will go down. So it's arch over the cervical rib, producing paresthesia along the medial border of the forearm, produce weakness and paresthesia of the small muscles of the hand. You can see here, it's a complete cervical rib, but on the other side, the rib is incomplete and is replaced by a fibrous Band. These are the small muscles of the hand, mainly the interossei, the palmar interossei, the dorsal interossei, as well as the lumbricals, especially here, the medial two lumbricals and the hypothenar muscles. But these are all supplied by the ulnar nerve because the thenar muscles and the lateral two lumbricals are supplied by the median nerve. Mainly, the um, compression affects the roots of the ulnar nerve and um, will affect these interossei and the medial two lumbrical muscles and result in clawing of the hand, especially pronounced on the medial side of the hand. As you can see it here, also you can see that it's not only clawing, but there is uh, concavity or dimpling in the interosseous spaces in addition to the clawing. Clawing is manifested by hyperextension of the metacarpophalangeal joint and flexion of the proximal and distal interpharyngeal joint. This is the opposite to the action of the interossei or lumbricals, which cause flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension of the interphalangeal joints. Vascular symptoms are less common than neurological symptoms. And as I mentioned, it is because of the compression of the subclavian artery. So this might result in diminished radial artery pulse when moving the head. This is especially seen in anterior scalene syndrome, one of the varieties of thoracic outlet syndrome. In this case, the patient is asked to rotate the neck ipsilaterally and flex it laterally to the opposite side and extend the head. And you can see that while palpating the strength of the radial pulse, the radial pulse will become diminished. Also, you might hear a bruit over the subclavian artery. Post-stenotic dilatation, as you can see it here, distal to the rib, might result in the formation of a thrombus and emboli are thrown off, which is very dangerous because thrombi will cause blockage of smaller vessels and might result in cold hands and diminished blood flow. As I mentioned that a person with thoracic outlet syndrome can have one or two of the subtypes of thoracic outlet syndrome. One of them is because of narrowing at this triangle, which you can see it here. This is again, this is the scalene triangle. This is one variety. The other variety is because of compression of the neurovascular structures, as you can see here, between the clavicle and the first rib. This is what we call the costoclavicular syndrome. Another subtype is because of compression of the neurovascular bundle, including the vein. The vein will also be included in the costoclavicular syndrome. And the third condition is because of compression of the neurovascular structures, including the vein, very close to the attachment of the pectoralis minor muscle, which is attached to the coracoid process of the scapula. As I mentioned, compression of the subclavian vein is the least common in 
thoracic outlet syndrome. Usually it doesn't take place when the compression is between the two scalenes because the subclavian vein is located anterior to the scalenus anterior, but it might be compressed. The vein might be compressed in the costoclavicular syndrome and in pectoralis minor syndrome, and this might result in enlargement of the veins of the arm. Remember that thoracic outlet syndrome can co also coexist with compression of the cervical sympathetic trunk. You can see this is the thoracic sympathetic trunk, which has to pass through the superior thoracic aperture, where it might be compressed, especially in cases of pancos tumor affecting the apex of the lung. And in, in this case, compression might affect the stellate ganglion, which is located very close to the neck of the first rib. And this will result in Horner's syndrome. Also, compression might affect the recurrent laryngeal nerve. You can see here, this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. On the left side, it recurs and passes upwards between the trachea and esophagus. Remember that the trachea and esophagus are present in the midline, and so the nerve ascends up, whether on the right or on the left side, and might be compressed. This nerve supplies motor fibers to the muscles of the larynx, and so its compression might result in hoarseness. Thank you.